However, you see him cracking that whip because the dot plot ends with the Fed funds rate with a two handle in front of it. So as long as he's living and breathing and nothing contagious occurs, systemic risk does not break out, there is no more zero bound. We stop it too. Welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. Now, on to today's episode. Welcome back to the Gold Exchange Podcast. We're coming at you live from New Orleans Investment Conference. I'm joined by Danielle DiMartino Booth of Quill Intelligence. Danielle, how are you today? Great to be here with you today. It's a nice, busy day in New Orleans, isn't it? Absolutely. Let's jump into the numbers. So today, we've got the unemployment print, 3.9%. Now, mm-hmm. we were had a low of 3.4%. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this starting to rise in unemployment, is that an actual structural issue we're going to see in the coming days? So it's funny, you know, it depends on which academic you ask. Uh, All the years that I was at the Fed, my mentor, uh, he he always said 0.3 percentage points um, before you get to an inflection point in a cycle. There's also something that's called the SOM rule, and it's a little bit more difficult to to cross that threshold. It's 0.5% increase in the unemployment rate off that low. So as of this morning's data, we have arrived. And so... Everything that we know historically, whether you look at at, at a, le- a more lenient way of looking at the unemployment rate or where we are today, we're in recession, and um, and I, and that is typically your unemployment rate goes up after you're already in recession. In other words, what was GDP going into um, in, in December of 2007 when we went into the Great Financial? GDP was 4.9%. What was GDP when we were double dipping in 1981? Because people forget that prior to the Great Recession, the Great Financial Crisis, the worst recession in U.S. history, besides the Great Depression, had been the double dip recession of the 19 of 1980 and 1981. Where was GDP when we entered that that recession? 4.3 percent. My point is, we typically have a very robust GDP print, like we did for the third quarter, 4.8 percent as we're already in recession, and that is exactly what the unemployment rate now has come back and validated. And lots of people have said, okay, we we see 5% interest rates, we're gonna see havoc in the markets, we're gonna see falling mm-hmm. stocks, bond prices going incredibly insane, and of course now unemployment. So where do you actually see that argument in terms of the recession? Do we see stock markets follow that kind of recessionary pattern? So I think what we're going to see, and people have to understand the order of things, In 2018, you know, Jay Powell was prompted to pivot after Halloween of 2018 when the debt of General Electric was downgraded. So then we ended up starting November the 14th of that year with 41 days with no issuance. Credit markets feed into equity markets. It's it's simply the way of uh, of, uh, the, the way that cycles proceed. The thing that made Powell pivot in 2019, January the 4th, 2019, I got condolence letters. Uh, when he pivoted was that there were so many Japanese banks, great big Japanese banks that had 40% or more of their assets in U.S. collateralized loan obligations. So there was the risk of systemic risk becoming unleashed. And that's why he pivoted that time. What's happened differently now? Why hasn't 5% broken the system? So you don't have this source of systemic risk that all of a sudden you would have seen a cascade of events. Right. Um, they were able to go in and fix that. The Fed was able to come in and start to build guardrails around liquidity within the treasury market yes. subsequent to 2018, 2019. So they have backstops now that make it to where 5% is not as destructive and we've not seen issuance decline. That's the most important thing. High yield bond issuance has crashed. It's down like 80% year over year, but it has not stopped. So as long as you can get a deal or so done, then you're not at a point where the 5% breaks anything. Now, we just got fresh bankruptcy data out this morning. It's a bloodbath. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about small businesses, medium-sized businesses, households. We're seeing bankruptcies go up quite a bit. But so far, no contagion. And that's why we can sit here and say, let's look back in the rearview mirror. You know, why isn't the sky falling? 
Because there hasn't been any contagion. Well, and the same thing happened in 2008, right? People said, wait a minute, how is it possible that these mortgage-backed securities have not fallen? How have they not been downgraded? There must right. be something wrong because the underlying asset is clearly garbage. Right. And yet, when you look around, the, the sky hasn't fallen, the, the ratings are still the same. So do you think that we're in between that period? Some analysts say, we've pulled the pin on the grenade, we've thrown it, but there's no explosion yet. Um, yes and no. Um, in 2008, you kind of had a, a snowball effect that started in 2007. And you know, once Bear Stearns, those two hedge funds went down, um, it, was, it was a very slow moving snowball effect until there was simply one bank went, then another bank went, that, and then we had contagion. Right, right now, what we, what we don't have is the snowball. Instead, we have ice. We don't have transactions occurring. And yes. that's the difference between what happened in 08 and where we are today. There are, I cannot tell you how many commercial real estate bankers, whether you're talking about people in the corporate bond market, everybody's hoping not that there's going to be a decline in interest rates or after this morning's payrolls report, gee, it's not gonna be July anymore now, it's gonna be June of 2004 that we see that first rate cut. That doesn't help anybody. That's, that's a pimple on the you-know-what of humanity. It doesn't help anybody. What bankers are holding out for, why we haven't seen transactions, is they need for something cataclysmic to occur to take interest rates, not down, but back down to the zero bound. And then you'll see transactions. So actually, what you're seeing right now today is much more problematic than 2008. Hmm. Because in 2008, at least we had kind of Movement. a slow-moving train wreck. Right now, people are just frozen, hoping to God that we have a reason to go back down to the zero bound so that they can actually move those office buildings off of their balance sheet, refinance those junk bonds. But for the moment, as long as you're anywhere near 5%, the difference between where they can refinance and where they originally financed, whether it be a building or a corporate bond, the gulf is still way too wide. So whoop de doo that Jay Powell might reduce interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point in June of 2024, that ain't going to help them. Right. And, and it does feel like there is this magnet back to 0% interest rates. That 0% interest rate almost gravitational pull. I have a question. Do you think we will ever actually go past the nominal zero and go to negative or is zero where we stay? No, I think that um, I think that Jay Powell has a much stronger grasp of his Federal Open Market Committee than most people appreciate. So even though he dismisses the dot plot, and well, he should because he's like anything can change in six or eight weeks. Right. He's correct. Yes. However, you see him cracking that whip because the dot plot ends with the Fed funds rate with a two handle in front of it. So as long as he's living and breathing, and nothing contagious occurs systemic risk does not break out there is no more zero bound we stop it too and so a lot of people have said two percent inflation is now gone that target is gone two percent inflation i was just going back and forth with a colleague trailing 12 months 1.88 baby we are headed for deflation oh. and people do not appreciate that by the way i'm sitting here looking at gold i ate a piece of gold chocolate it was delicious that was my breakfast of champions today deflationary times if it's they're accompanied by financial crises are fabulous for gold fabulous and i do want to talk about gold for a second here so Gold has held up surprisingly well, not broken through all-time highs yet, but held up surprisingly well. A lot of people have said, well, Treasury yields a little bit over five. Now, monetary metals, we pay interest on gold, so we're competing. But a lot of people have said, okay, now there's this geopolitical risk, but that's transitory. Hopefully, we pray for peace. But do you see headwinds for gold, or do you actually see gold breaking out here in terms of a potential recessionary mm, environment yeah, with no, Cascades? It, look, this is, this is when we get, I actually just watched somebody on Bubble Vision arguing with a guest. The only thing the guest was doing was just pointing out the movement in the unemployment rate and just saying, hey, multiple job holders, all time new record, people are working two jobs, maybe they don't have a, a, enough money. And the anchor was fighting the guest, trying to say life is good. Okay, that's not gonna last and bless her heart, but my point is now we cross the Rubicon. We've had the unemployment rate move a half a percentage point off its low. Now, 
everybody else has to recognize the recession. This is when things start to get ugly, which means that they'll get better for gold. Yeah, and, and I do feel bad because in the gold industry, bad news is good news, unfortunately. Right. And now let's talk about other asset classes here. So there's been a kind of flight to safety. Gold has benefited from that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the U.S. economy, T-bills have benefited from that as well? People oh. looking at the yuan, the yen, the yep. ruble and saying, I, I can't knowingly put my money there. Yep. So, you know, every uh, good, good buddy of mine, 15 years now, Michael Hartman, he's the chief strategist at Bank of America. Every Thursday night, he publishes The Flow Show. And in his latest, which came out 12 hours ago, he showed that that T-bills, ownership of T-bills across their whole high net worth universe of clients at Bank of America, uh, what we used to call Mother Merrill, never seen higher ownership of T-bills. So there's, and by the way, including my four kids, my 77-year-old retired mom, me, I mean, everybody I know is up to their eyeballs in T-bills right. with good reason. Yes. Because you don't have to, you're not being compensated for taking on credit risk in this environment at all. But, but you don't have to be. You don't have to be. I mean, I mean once high yield yields are maybe 15%. Let's talk about it. Then you might be saying, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a gamble on, on the default rate right. cycle because I'm, I'm getting compensated for taking that risk. But right now, you're still not getting compensated for taking on credit risk. So why bother? And so, do you actually see that as an argument against stocks right now? People say, well, five percent risk free, I can get from a treasury bill. Am I really gonna throw some more money into the stock market? A lot of people clearly are, but I think what you're seeing is technical in nature. It's flows. Your, your Bitcoin, your crypto. Heads were all over, you know, we're all over social media saying Bitcoin's up. You know, that means stocks are going to the moon. Central banks have stopped tightening. That means stocks are going to the moon. Everything means stocks are going to the moon. But at the end of the day, there's one thing that cause, causes stocks to slow down, and that is you can get any 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 account in the world to fudge your bottom line. Hmm. Nobody can fudge your top line. So when revenues start to get hit that's when it, it, it's simply game over for stocks. And that's what recession is, right? right? Recession is a reflection of your top line growth potential or lack thereof. Once you've got a negative sign in front of revenues, it's game over until your dividend yield gets high enough to say, you know, look at these defensive stocks. That's a 7% dividend yield. I can get more than I can get on my T-bill. But for now, again, whether you're talking about junk bonds or equities, you're not being compensated enough income-wise mm. to take the added risk on. And Danielle, what I always love about your analysis is that you're a smart woman. You look at the data. You have that actual in front of you, like right on the tip of your tongue. But what I love the most is that you bring it back down to regular people. How is this going to affect regular people who have a mortgage, who have a home, and are saying, look, I don't understand how T-bill issuance work. Just tell me, Danielle, what should I be looking out for right now? Look, I, I think if you're a regular retiree or thinking about retiring, if you've got a low mortgage rate, God bless you, keep it. Pray God that your property taxes don't go up as much as they are in a lot of places in America and or your homeowner's insurance policy. Um, but in an environment like today, you know, I, I used to go to the local bank in East Haven, Connecticut with my grandmother when she used to roll over her 5% CD. Do it. It's pretty easy. It's easy enough to be in a place where you don't have to take risks. You can just plop your money in cash, go to your bank, take out a CD. They'll do it for you. They're happy to keep your deposits in a world where there's a, still a, as my buddy Jim Bianco says, there's still a power walk out of deposits from big banks. So, but keep your money in cash because you can. And if you've got a low mortgage rate mortgage, be happy for that. And, and Quill Intelligence, you guys put out these awesome reports. One you had out for free about the banking sector. And, and I want to ask you, do you see this kind of conglomeration happening in the banking sector? And do you think that that is for good? Or do you think that this might have to change with this recession or with this inflationary or deflationary environment coming? Well, first of all, um, you know, I, one of our pro clients, one of our institutional clients, uh, he and I get together and say, it's a wonderful life. And, and we genuinely hope that that the fabric of the community banking system in this country 
that, that it holds together. Right. And when you think about what the big three automakers have done, mm. or what Walmart has done, when you think of what so many great big oligopolies have done to small towns in America, right. you could actually see smaller towns rallying around their community bank to mm. keep it in business. Furthermore, I think that at this point, if the FDIC could broker more marriages that it would have, mm -hmm. it's really hard to facilitate the merger of two banks when they're sitting on hold maturity losses, the magnitude of which they are, and nobody knows what the underlying collateral in their commercial real estate portfolio is worth because they're, because as I said, this is not 2008 snowball, we're frozen. So until there are transactions, you, all you know is that banks have tremendous losses in their treasury and mortgage-backed securities holdings, lower now than they were a week ago. Um, but but it, it's also the underlying collateral backing their loan books that's a big unknown. So it's very difficult to press through with the regional bank mergers that I think need to occur. Hmm. Regional bank mergers. And I do want to ask a question there. We talk a lot about this mark-to-market accounting. And so how is that kind of plugged one of these holes that in, in decades past has not been there. Well, mark to, mark, mark to target. That's what, that's what I like to call it. Um, and, and there's been a lot of that going on, but bear in mind, Silicon Valley Bank, even though it's you know a distant memory, and it's as if none of this ever happened in March, that whole nasty business, regulators are much more forthright and stringent than they were six, nine months ago. End of story. So you don't have the same grace that you would have when it comes to trying to hold securities at an artificially high level. And has the bank term funding facility helped with that? Or do you think that that's just kind of a, a story that came and went? I mean, on my Twitter feed, it's it's Armageddon every single day. I mean, We're J QE, Danielle. JP Morgan, it's QE. You know, JP Morgan came out with an analysis right when the bank funding facility was introduced. And they said, okay, given the losses that are sitting there, this facility could be about $2 trillion. Mm -hmm. It's $108 billion. And every week they're like, it went up five cents. And I'm like, oh, the world is ending for sure. I know it is. It's QE. I'm like, people, can we please get a grasp of what $108 billion is in the grand scheme yeah. of things in a facility that could have gone all the way up to $2 trillion, but the banks didn't want to have to take the capital hit. There was a massive quid pro quo. Anybody who's listening to Michael Barr at the Fed, yeah. banking supervision and regulation, yeah. you, can, you can have all the 100 cents on the dollar you want if you're going to pay for it in capital. Yeah. And try taking that to your, to your board of directors if you're a banker. Sorry. I took 20 cents on the dollar. Oh, we're going to have to raise capital. You get fired. So people do not understand that there is very much a huge price to be paid. And that's why there's been so little uptake. And now I want to ask you, kind of talking about the Twitterverse for a second. Uh -huh. there's, there's a lot of thin twit that goes on talking about this fad or that fad or trust me, this is QE. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you now, who are you reading? Who do you like? And what is something that people can say, okay, when, when I need to just have good, solid data, where does Daniel DiMartino Booth go other than Quill Intelligence? Well, um, you know, uh, Jeff Snyder's, he's a smart cookie. We just had him on the podcast. He's great. Uh, you know, he actually understands the inner workings. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of Joseph Wang's conclusions, but he too understands the plumbing of the financial system. He understands that if the discount window borrowing goes up, that that's really bad and not QE. So he's not a complete moron. So, but I follow him as well. I, I was mentioning Randy Woodward, George Goncalves. There's some great people out on Twitter who might not be huge presences, but boy, do they know what they're talking about. Um, the ones I don't follow are the ones that everybody else does because they tend to have something that they're selling, literally. Right. And, where there's smoke, there's usually fire. So I tell everybody who follows me on Twitter, you know, if there's a narrative, that means that something is for sale. If somebody's just disseminating data, then there's nothing for sale. I mean, I mean, if you don't read me, then you're just, why, why bother not being a QI pro? Or why, not, why bother not being a QI research subscriber? And the feedback we get from our clients is it's just data. It's just data. And people who try and carve data to communicate their narrative, be very, very cautious. 
Now, I want to ask you, because you obviously have that kind of insider feel at the Fed. We've heard talks that people think Powell will actually be let go if something is to happen. Do you actually see his position solidified if a crisis happens, or do you think he's actually on the chopping block? Well, we're going into an election year, right? I mean, we have, what, I think Tuesday's election day, so we're literally tick-tock, tick-tock, one year away from election day. Mm. However, uh, if you look back, you have to go back to the late 1870s to find a precedent of a U.S. president firing hmm. the head of an agency, okay? So Jay Powell's email address ends in .gov because he's a full federal employee. When I was at the Dallas Fed, my email address ended in .org hmm. because we're a quasi-public right. private entity that pays banks their dividends first. So, but you have to look back, I think 1873 or so, to when the last time a president tried to fire the head of a public agency. And you know, to, to use a parallel, Every time the idea of a filibuster comes up, somebody from one side of the aisle says, no, filibuster is not good because then if then when the next party is in power, then they can use that against us if there's no filibuster. Same exact situation. If they try to fire Powell, what the Supreme Court precedent dictates is that the members of Federal Reserve Board could elect to keep him in his position until the Supreme Court rules on the legality of the president firing for cause, if there's no cause, firing for cause somebody for purely political purposes. Now, why would they do that? Because the Federal Reserve Board is full of a bunch of, oh, I almost said a bad word. Careful. Um, <laughs> it's full of a bunch of progressives um, who disagree, most of whom disagree with Jay Powell, like viscerally right. disagree with him. They're huge dubs. However, what happens if this president can fire a Fed chair. That means that when the tables are turned in another four years, another president can come along and say, hey, you progressive person who wants central bank digital currency and you want for the Federal Reserve to resolve climate change because that's feasible, I'm gonna fire you. So they don't want that precedent to be established. So I think that the Federal Reserve Board would put their foot down and say, we're gonna wait until the Supreme Court rules on the legality of a president firing the head of a federal agency. And it, again, clearly I need to get out more because I'm reading 1873 Supreme Court precedent. That's why we love you. But, but that, that, that is where we are, very difficult. And obviously had, had Donald Trump been able to fire him, he would have, so. Now, I want to ask you, you mentioned central bank digital currencies. That's another big thing on financial Twitter. They think we're going to have a CBDC. The Fed is this close to, to publishing one tomorrow. We're all Dogs gonna be... and cats are going to move in together. I mean, it's the end of life. Yes. So so let, let's talk about quickly, wh why are people thinking that there's going to be a central bank digital currency? And, and what are they reading that we're missing? Well, I mean, again, uh, you know, if, I can't count on one hand Jay Powell's you know, allies on the Federal Reserve Board. Mm. So there are a lot of people in very powerful positions who do advocate for George Orwell, right? right. And it's a really sexy thing to talk about. <laughs> Big right. Brother's watching what I spend, and oh, if, if I don't spend it, Ken Rogoff says that they're gonna haircut me. So they're gonna take three cents of every dollar that I leave in a savings account and take that away from me if I don't spend it. And so that would be negative like interest rates, controlled right? Controlled economy, yeah, I mean, right. but, yeah, yes, and I would be living in Italy. And we'd have a harder time doing this interview because if we're going to go full-blown socialism, yes. then A, we need to call have, it full-blown socialism. Problems. And we've got bigger problems. We, we do. We have bigger problems if we go full Soviet, full, you know, full People's Bank of China where we're monitoring what Americans purchase. And, and that's, again, you know, warts and all. Do I like the, did I like the Powell pivot? Mm. No. Am I his biggest, am I like, hey, he's my fanboy. Oh my God, it's Powell. No, but he will stand in front of like, like in front of machine gun fire preventing central bank digital currency. So as long as he's there, I sleep at night. And final question here as we come towards the end. So we have a lot of guests come on to the Gold Exchange podcast. We talk a lot about different topics. We've had Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder was just on. We've had Gwen Preston and- Brent Johnson was in the NBA training class behind me. Boy, I tortured him at DLJ anyways. And Brent Johnson's going to be at our private event t tonight. We're right. going to be talking about the future of the dollar, gold, currencies, questions like that, treasury issuance as well. What's a question you should be asking or we should be asking other guests of the Gold Exchange podcast? I would love for anybody to be able to tell me, given 
given we've only seen post-financial crisis an increase in sovereign debt priced in dollars, I would love for anybody to tell me how the dollar is going to be replaced, how the dollar is going to be displaced, just given the fact that we've seen increased dollar issuance in from other countries. I get it. It's another really sexy subject, but nobody's been able to tell me how it's going to happen unless they're like, Bitcoin solves everything. And I'm right. like, of course it does. Course. I've got a clogged sink. Can you help? So other than, other than a very hollow answer, nobody's ever been able to communicate to me how, given its footprint, the dollar can be displaced. I cannot recommend enough Fed Up, your book, Thank you. Quill Intelligence. Can you tell people where they can find more of your work mm -hmm. as well as Quill Intelligence? So um, uh, come to demartinoboot.substack.com. It's a mouthful. I got it. Um, or come to qiresearch.com because you know we, we, have, we have fabulous uh, institutional clients and a Bloomberg chat room that's always on fire and it's a collaboration. So if you're an institutional client of ours, you're part of a group, you're part of a community, we help each other, we learn from each other, and it's just, it's, it's absolutely the best bang for your money that exists. And if you have insomnia and you don't yet, at Demartino Booth, follow me on Twitter, never boring. Danielle, I want to thank you so much for coming back onto the Gold Exchange Podcast. I'm sure we'll see you again. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, the pleasure is mine, thank you. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the Gold Yield Marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions, and are gold financing simplified, reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. See you next time.